So then we started looking at a situation where I will not even do a wrong shift on the parser and we found that this really takes care of the situation and dollar is in the follow of first thing and then if I say that C star D which is not in the language <coughs> parser is immediately going to be there and add. Okay, so it will not do even a wrong shift there okay, or reduction. Okay. And on error, canonical LR parser never makes a shift to do smooth okay, and immediately catches an error and therefore as far as error recovery is concerned, this is the most powerful parsing method we have. Okay. Problem was that parse table is just going to be too large. Okay. It's an order of magnitude of this. So then we started looking at LALR pass table. Now LALR body comes from look ahead LR. Okay. Now it's not clear I mean, by look ahead because everything is look ahead, but this is the name which was given to it historically. So this is what we follow. And this has not been explained in literature but when what is the difference here? When what, why it called look ahead. Okay. So what we do here is that we look at similar looking states. And when we say similar looking state, what that means is the states which have the same kernel but different look okay, instead of LR1 <coughs> And then we try to merge them. Okay. So for example, when we had I4 and I7, where the kernel was the same which said C goes to D dot, and this is the LR2 item, and the look ahead in this case was CD, and in this case was dollar, we said we can merge this. And if we merge it, okay, we are going to replace both 4 and 7 by let us say new state I47. What does it consist of? Now it consists of <coughs> the same kernel with a look ahead of C, D and all. And similarly we saw that 3 and 6, 8 and 9, they also form pairs and if we merge all the LR1 items which have all the, so I look at all the sets of LR1 items and I merge them, okay, I am going to get <coughs> only the items where the kernels will be same, but look ahead will be different. Okay. And then we started the discussion saying that if I construct now an LALR pass table, what will be the size of this table? And size we came to a conclusion that size is going to be same as SLR. Okay. The question that came was, will it be having the same power as SLR or it will be more powerful? <coughs> that is what we were discussing. And turns out, okay, I mean, we can do it by construction of languages, that the languages which are not in SLR but which are in LALR. LALR, it turns out, is more powerful than SLR but less powerful than canonical LR. Okay, because we have lost out on certain information when you started compacting the tables. Okay. So when we construct LALR pass table is that, so this is a longer step, that first we construct all sets of LR1 items, okay. this is the step we went through and then we say that for each core which is present in LR1, okay, find all the sets having the same core and replace this set by their uni. Okay. And when I do that, then I am going to get now a set of LR1 items which will be of the form which says J0 to Jm after the system after merging many of the states in I0 to Yn which are having the same core. Okay. And once you do this, then we construct parse table as we did earlier. <laughs> there is no difference. Okay? So only thing that will happen now is that earlier you had multiple rows for the common kernels but different look aheads and now I will have the same row. So what is the implication on this? Okay? So J is each of these J's is actually a union of many of the items. So implication now is that I have compact parse tables but at the same time, okay, I have little less power than what I could do in canonical LR. So in fact, I mean, we can again find examples where you will see that the languages which are in canonical LR but which are not in LALR. Okay. Now when I say something is in canonical LR and is not in LALR, what does that mean for the field? In terms of the past table and what are the kind of problems? So when we looked at the first SLR table, we said that a grammar is going to be in SLR if and what was that if condition? If it does not have multiple entries in the past table. Okay. And then we found that we had an example where we, when we were trying to construct an SLR parser, at least one cell had multiple entries, which was the shift reduce function. Okay. And then we went to canonical LR, and now we say that language is in canonical LR if you do not have multiple entries. 
But if there is a language which is in canonical LR and is not in, not in LALR after this merger, what does that mean in terms of conflicts? It can have multiple entries in the table, but what kind of entries these will be? Will it be shift reduce or reduce reduce? Can I have shift reduce conflicts in LALR? If the grammar was in canonical LR. Okay, so why is that? So only thing that can happen is that if I merge these tables now or if I merge these states, it cannot give rise to a shift reduce conflict. And the argument is very simple that if there is a shift reduce conflict in LALR, then that conflict must have existed in canonical LALR. That means the grammar in itself was not in canonical LALR. So if a grammar is in canonical LALR, then after merger it cannot give rise to new shift reduce conflicts. It can only give rise to reduce reduce conflicts. Okay? So definitely there are languages like this. Okay? So since they have the same core, so go to of Jx, the x where is a grammar symbol, will also have the same core. Okay? So this is coming from construction, so this is how we construct. And this is how LALR parse table is going to look. So what I have done is I have replaced states 3 and 6 by now a new state symbol called 3, 6, 4 and 7 by new state symbol 4, 7, and 8 and 9 by new state symbol as 8, 9. Okay? So it has three fewer states as compared to canonical LR as far as this example is concerned. And this is exactly the same number of states as far as SLR parse table will go. But the table actually will be different okay? because it will have more entries. So let's not try to even compare unless I really construct an SLR parser. Only thing we can assert at this point of time is that the number of states are going to be exactly the same and not any different. Okay? So again, looking at some of the properties of LALR parser, if I now look at this reduction, okay, what is going to happen now? That I have now C star D, C star D is my language and suppose I give only input as C star D. What will happen? case of LALR parse table, not accept. So suppose my input to LALR parse table now is C star D. Okay. Where will it catch the error? So if we keep on now saying that C star D will get reduced to capital C. Right? And then it will see a dollar, but since this is the first capital C, it will still not be able to accept it because I still have a rule which says S goes to CC or S goes to A. So it will not accept, but it will now do additional shifts. But before further reduction, it will catch that. So this is what happens here. So in general, core is a set of LR0 items and LR1 grammar may produce more than one set of items for the same core. And merging this never produces shift reduce conflict, but may produce reduce reduce conflicts. Okay? And SLR and LALR parser have the same number of states. Both the parse tables are going to have the same number of states. Continuing on this discussion, so merging may result into conflicts in LALR, and these conflicts are reduce reduce conflict. So here is a small argument which says that why I cannot have a shift reduce conflict. So shift reduce conflict will come only if I have an LR1 item of this form, it says x goes to alpha dot with a look ahead of a and this says y goes to gamma dot a beta with a look ahead of b. Okay? Now what is happening here? That in this case, I am ready for reduction and in this case, I am saying that I can shift. Okay? Now if I have such an LR1 item in LALR parse table, then there must have been some state from where I arrived in this state. So similar conflict must have existed in the earlier state okay, before merger and therefore I cannot have any kind of shift reduced conflicts but sorry just a minute.
Okay. But if I look at the situation, okay, where suppose I had states like this, which said x goes to alpha dot on a look ahead of A and y goes to alpha dot on a look ahead of B. And there was another state where I said x goes to alpha dot on a look ahead of B and y goes to alpha dot on a look ahead of A. After merger, I am going to produce a state like this. Okay. And this state clearly has a reduced reduced conflict. Okay. Earlier, this conflict did not exist. Okay. So, this is what can happen when I construct LALR positive. Okay. Now, only thing that is another important thing to remember is that this is actually not how we construct LALR pass tables. It is not that I first construct a canonical LR pass table and then reduce it to LALR. They are going to be direct methods for constructions of LALR pass tables. Only thing is these methods are little more complex and not logically as clean. So, they are direct but complicated and they are efficient algorithms. So, normally a tool which implements construction of LALR pass table is not going to take you through construction of canonical LR pass table and then reducing it to LALR. Okay. But uh, to explain, this route seems to be much better where at least conceptually you understand what is the difference between canonical LR and LALR. Okay. And if I look at relative powers, yeah. then SLR1 okay, is less powerful than LALR1 and that is still less powerful than <coughs> canonical LR1. Okay. And if I look ahead, if I have a look ahead of K, then the same thing applies that for a fixed set of or fixed number of look ahead, SLR1 is still going to be less powerful than canonical LR. So, languages which can be passed by this particular parser cannot be passed by this. And similarly, LLK is less powerful than <coughs> LRK. Okay. And why LLK is less powerful than LRK? Can you think of an argument? Why LL in general is less powerful as compared to LR? Hmm, why? Sorry, somebody is left. But we, we know how to remove left recursion, right? So left recursion is no longer an issue. So think about it. Okay. In general, argument is that if I am looking at LL parse table or I am trying to do top down parsing, then what information do I have? I have a symbol which I want to expand and I have k look ahead. Based on that, I take a decision. Okay. What do I have in case of LR? LR, I have the full stack information. My state information captures whatever I have seen, which in case of LL is not possible. In case of LL, all you are saying is that this is the grammar symbol I want to expand. Here you are saying whatever I have seen, that is extra information I have. So that gives more power to, more power to LR parsing. Okay. And in general, programming languages, most programming languages actually fall in this class LALR. So when you look at tool like Yak or Bison, what they are generating is an LALR parser and not a canonical LALR parser. Of course, there are parser generators like LRJ which are available for canonical LR, but for all practical purposes, LALR is sufficient as far as programming languages are concerned. And again, how do I do error recovery? In general in LR parsers. Okay, so think about it now. So let's let me draw this figure for you so that at least you can think about this. That suppose this is my stack and I have now a state S and I have a look ahead, let's say A, and now when I refer to my pass table, I find that SA is an error state. <coughs> so how will I recover from this? All of you came up with nice solutions in case of a top down parser. So, how can I continue parsing? Suppose I reach this configuration. How can I continue parsing from here? Skip some tokens. Skip some tokens and then, then what? Start wherever. So, if I say that I skip some tokens here, okay, uh, here and reach, let's say, a symbol B on which I can find an action here, okay, what happens in that case? Conceptually, now think conceptually because. What you're saying is valid because if I look at my parse table, I'm saying that from this point onwards I can continue parsing. Okay. So let me give you an example. Okay. Let me write a piece of program. Suppose I say A is sine B plus C, then C is sine 
QR and X is sine Y plus Z. Okay. Let's say 100. Okay. So, what is missing here is the plus symbol. Right. Okay. So, I reach some state where I have seen this, I have seen this, I have seen this part. Then I am expecting to see an operator, but what I see is an identifier. Okay. So, I will say I could have done continued parsing on an operator. Right. So, I say skip this, skip this, skip this, skip this, skip this, and I reach here and I have skipped all this. Okay. Does that make sense? that has been provided is or that is being proposed is that if I skip everything up to semicolon okay, and then continue parsing from here then I will be good right. But how do I now do that in terms of the parser. So, assuming that there is a correct solution now I explain that in terms of the parsing. Hmm? Look ahead of Okay. So let me try to articulate what you're saying. Okay. That imagine that there is no error here. Okay. Now suppose there is no error here, then this would have reduced to say a statement. Okay. So, there is some state here followed by a statement, then this whole thing would have reduced. Okay. So, what we try to do is we try to create a situation where we say let us skip this till the end and suppose I say that statement is a symbol, I want to skip till the end of this. Then I say that whatever is the symbol now, so I have to now do two manipulations. One that I keep going down into the state. So, first I identify I identify certain markers and what are these certain markers? So, for example, statement is a marker and I say that in case I am parsing a statement and I find there is an error in the statement, then I will skip everything up to the end of the statement. Okay. That means I am basically saying that when I skip everything up to the end of the statement, okay, I will assume that I have ignored all these errors and as if this error never existed. Okay. So, that means first I have to go down and find state corresponding to this. Okay. And then, once I have discarded all these symbols, okay, then in this state, okay, I push statement, okay, and then that will give me a valid go to, right? That I will be able to find in my pass table. And once I have reached this, then what do I do? I say skip everything up to the end of the statement. That means start scanning my input, skip everything up to semicolon, and once I reach here, then continue parsing, right? So, what we do is that. LR parser always defines what are the symbols on which you want to synchronize, on which you want to do error recovery. So, you can say that when it comes to end of statement that is one thing, you can say define end of block, you can say end of function, the choice is up to the parser builder, okay, whosoever is building the parser. You can say that this term, uh, this is the going to be the granularity of my error recovery. Okay. Now, if you want to be very ambitious and you say that I will only do up to the level of sub-expression that can become very complex. Okay. So, normally what is done is we try to find certain blocks where we say that if an error occurs, then I will skip up to end of that block. Okay. And if I skip up to end of that block, in terms of parser, I will say that on stack find a state which has a valid go to on that particular symbol, then pop everything up to that state, push this symbol, do a go to, skip an input till you have reached end of that statement and continue parsing from there. Right? So, this is what will happen that if I say that there is an error, I will say skip this whole thing, skip it up to semicolon and therefore, I will start scanning my input, discard all these symbols, then I will try to continue parsing from here. On, on the stack, I will pop symbols which will be taking me to this state, then I will push the 
non terminal corresponding to this have a valid go to and then continue parsing from there. Make sense? Okay. So I could write down same thing say for a block or same thing for a function. Okay. So I can say that whenever there is an error in a function, I will discard everything up to the end of the function. Okay. So normally this is kept at the level of a statement. Okay. So error recovery is if you detect an error when entry in the action table is found to be empty. So this is called panic mode error recovery. Scan down the stack until you have a state with a go to on a particular non terminal A. Okay. And then discard 0 or more input symbol until you find a symbol which is which can legitimately in the follow of A. And then stack the state, this state, obviously by pushing this A symbol and then resume passing from that point onwards. Okay. And what is the choice of A? Normally these are some non terminals which represent a major program piece. So for example, it could be statement, it could be a block, it could be a function and so on. Okay. So a priori you have to take a decision as parser generator, as a parser developer that what is the error recovery you are going to do and at what level you want to do this error recovery. So most parsers will say that I want to do error recovery at the level of a statement. But if there is an error in a statement, then you try to discard everything up to the end of the statement and then continue on that. Clear both in terms of concept as well as in terms of the stack and input. Okay. So now we have some parser generators. We do not really write parsers by hand. So we understand how parsers work internally. And what we have are parser generator. Yak is one, Bison is another parser generator which is very common. And these are really source program specifications are LALR grammars. If you write grammars in LALR, okay, they will be able to generate then parsers for this. Okay. And the format <coughs> just to refresh your memories, okay, we have declaration followed by two special symbols followed by all the translation rules and followed by all the CVPs. Okay. This is how the structure of specifications look. Okay. And if I look at block diagram, this is how the block diagram looks. Now you can see that I am using LEX and YAC together. YAC is generating this file called y.tab.c in which I have to do a hash include for LEX.yy.c which has been generated from a lexical editor. And then when I use the native C compiler to compile this file, it gives me an executable which can take an input program and can give me, can do parsing. Abstract syntax tree to generate abstract syntax tree, you will have to write certain actions in your file which will say that create a tree as you are going through the process of parsing. Okay. But in general, okay, it will be able to say whether the string belongs to the language or not. Okay. And also one important thing to remember here is from implementation point of view that there is a variable called yydebug in y.tab.c. Okay. It is a hash defined variable if you just edit this file you will find that this says hash defined by y debug as 0. If you turn that on to 1, then you find that when you are trying to generate parsers and your grammar has an error, they will give you a lot of debugging information. Okay. So this variable can be used to turn on the debugging and can get all the stack information. That means every time you see a symbol, what is being pushed, what is being popped, what is being reduced, all that information will start coming out as debugging information. So that will also help you in understanding how your parser is working. And in case something is going wrong, you will be able to figure that out. Okay. So this is where we will close our discussion on parsing. And here is a reading assignment. And if you finish this reading <coughs> assignment before your mid-term exam, it will be helpful. Basically, look at book by Aho Lam Sethi Rulman, chapters 1 to 4. But you can skip sections 3.6 to 3.9, which basically say, how do I generate a finite state machine from regular expressions, how do I generate non-deterministic finite automata, how do I reduce that to a deterministic finite automata, how I minimize it and so on, which I am sure you can go back and start looking into your views course. But it will be helpful if you read all this before your next okay. So this is where I will close discussion on parsing and we will move on to type checking. If you have any questions at this point of time, we can discuss that. Otherwise, I will move on to the next one. Any questions about parsing? Anything? Okay. Whether it's top down, bottom up, tool, whatever questions 
comments you may have at this point. So shall we move on to bank checking? Anything else? Okay. So then let's move on to type checking. Okay. So here is what we are trying to do in the semantic analysis phase. Okay. This foil is again coming from what we had in the introduction. Okay. So now we want to check the meaning of the program. And also we want to report all the errors. We also want to disambiguate all the overloaded operators. Okay. So here is a question of, for example, uh, well, in this example I don't have an example of overloading, but we discussed enough examples of overloading where we found that there may be an operator which depending upon the cortex may have a different meaning. Okay. So we want to exactly find out what are the overloaded operators and what are the overloaded functions. So some languages are going to come given the overloaded functions, then you want to do type coercion. So in case your expression can permit <coughs> variables of different types, then you want to do type conversions there. And static type checking part is going to be that we just want to do type checking, we want to do control flow checking, which says that I cannot jump into middle of control flow. I want to do uniqueness checking saying that all my <coughs> variables <coughs> in the same context are going to have a unique meaning or unique name and I want to do name checks so sometimes blocks may require that the begin block and end block may have a name and that name has to be same and so on okay but this list in no way is exhaustive and is actually language dependent so depending on the language what kind of type checking you want to do you will have to enumerate a list of types there so this is something which is beyond the syntax analysis and Obviously, what we are trying to do here is, which was not possible, something looking at the context free grammar formalism we had. Okay? So, syntax analysis was all based on context free grammars, and we want to now look at some errors which are deeper than what syntax analysis would catch. Okay? So, there is, when I look at programs and I look at programming languages, and we talk about correctness issues there in the program. So, I am not going to logic part, I am still sticking to the language definition. There are some issues which are deeper than the syntax. Okay? So I may permit something in syntax, and in fact, syntax analyzer always accepts a superset of the language. Okay? What we are trying to do now is we are trying to nail it down to saying that whether it is sticking to the semantics of the language I have defined. Okay? So some language features cannot be modeled using context-free grammar formalism. Okay? And one of the very common features you will find that if I want to check whether an identifier has been declared before use, I cannot model it using this context free grammar formula. In fact, I mean context free grammar will look something like this, W A W where W is sigma star, okay? and this is something which is not in context free. <coughs> this you can check. Okay? So beyond syntax, okay, here are now concrete examples. So suppose we say that I have a string x and an int y, and then I write an expression which says x is assigned, uh, y is assigned x plus 3. Okay? Now clearly you can see that there is a type error here, 
if I do not permit this addition on string and int, okay. but when I parse this, okay, this is not an error, okay, because all it is saying is as far as parsing rules are concerned, that right hand side is an expression, left hand side is a variable okay, and that should be fine. Okay. 